Welcome to the official launch of the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Endowed Research Fund. We thank you for making the time to attend this event today. I am Nosila and I'll be your MC for today. Just to share a bit more about me, I, I was a medical social worker for five years and my interest in research led me to return to NUS as a full-time master's research student. The transition from practice to research has not been easy, but entirely rewarding. I'm excited to be involved in the launch of this fund, donated by Mr. Keith Chua, to NUS, which will empower other practitioners to conduct research. The social work department is grateful to have Professor Tan Cho Chuan, the president of NUS, here with us today to celebrate this significant milestone for the department. Let us put our hands together to welcome Professor Tan on stage to deliver the welcome address. <laughs> Professor Tan, please. Good morning, Mr. Keith Chua, the trustee of the Mrs. Li Chun Guan Trust Fund, and uh, his uh, wife and uh, children. Professor Lino Wee, uh, Vice Dean of Research, distinguished speakers, panelists, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, uh, let me warmly welcome you to NUS and thank you very much indeed for coming despite the thunder, lightning and rain to uh, help us uh, celebrate this uh, very important event. It is really uh, wonderful and very heartening to see so many stakeholders of our diverse and dynamic social work community <clears throat> gather for the official launch of the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Endowed Research Fund this morning. The NUS Social Work Department and NUS are, are truly honoured to be the recipient of the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Endowed Research Fund. This research fund is a bold and innovative programme that will enable the department and NUS to engage with frontline practitioners to conduct practice research that will enhance service provision and delivery in the social work sector. Well, this practice research approach strives to engage stakeholders, including service providers, service users and caregivers, in the entire research process, from the conceptualization of ideas to implementation and dissemination for practice. This is really critical because the whole idea and the, the innovative element of this program is that the research and its findings are meant to be translational in nature. That is, it is envisaged that the outcomes of this research will help inform frontline work and also be adapted into new teaching and training materials that will provide not just up-to-date but also practical and contextualized knowledge and insights for students and professionals. From the view of social work practitioners and professionals, this fund will allow for partnering with NUS to access academic expertise, which will enable the better analysis and understanding of specific challenges, solutions and outcomes. And I think this evidence-based approach will be very important because it will help us to better refine solutions and practices, which will further increase the benefit and impact to the individuals, families in the community. From the point of view of NUS and our researchers, this fund represents a tremendous new opportunity to build and to extend our networks beyond the university and to help us even contribute even more our expertise to tackling and solving present-day challenges that will have a real-world impact. I think the university will benefit greatly from uh, this program because through the close interaction and work with practitioners and professionals on the ground, we too will learn a great deal. We will obtain a deeper and more complete understanding of the major issues in social work arena, as well as help us identify new opportunities where we can create and produce greater positive impact, both in the practice arena, but also in terms of education and research programs. I think this uh, combining together of rigorous scientific and evidence-based approach with uh, a deep engagement with real world and frontline perspectives and practices, this is really innovative. And I'm, con I'm confident that this new program will have a major impact on enhancing the social work sector, improving the accessibility, delivery, and design of services 
enhancing the well-being of service users and contributing to policy discussions at the organizational agency and national levels. But most importantly, I think, to uh, help us do an even better job for the people in the community that we all serve. Of course, this program would not be possible without the strong support and vision of the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Trust Fund and its trustee, Mr. Ki Chua. Mrs. Lee was well known as a pioneering philanthropist who believed in improving outcomes and benefiting the community through bold and forward-thinking innovations. Mr. Keith Chua is also really well known as a visionary with a deep sense of uh, feeling of, for the community and the need to work in innovative ways to improve the conditions within the community and the people who live in it. And uh, Mr. Keith Chua, of course, is a very strong supporter of uh, many programs in NUS, for which we are very grateful. And these programs uh, have revolved around initiatives that cultivate community consciousness and that promotes community well-being. So on behalf of the Social Work Department and the rest of us in NUS, I'd like to express our really deep appreciation uh, to the fund and to Mr. Keith Chua for uh, partnering NUS on this very important initiative and endeavour. On our part, uh, my colleagues and I will work really hard to ensure that this important new initiative will be a great success and that the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Endowed Research Fund will become a pioneering platform that will catalyze research grounded practices, advance knowledge and delivery, and ultimately lead to the betterment of our community and our nation. So we will, are fully committed to this. We are very excited with the opportunity and we want to thank Keith and the Trust once again for giving us this chance to work with you once again on yet another very important initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. We are also honoured to have Mr. Keith Chua, the trustee of the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Trust Fund, here with us today. Mr. Keith Chua is the great-grandson of the late Mrs. Lee Chun Guan, who championed many causes, including women's education and reduction of child mortality. Mr. Chua has continued to support her causes in education and healthcare in Singapore and abroad. A long-time supporter of education and research initiatives in NUS, he first initiated the idea of philanthropy as a subject to be offered at the NUS Business School, which culminated into an initial gift of $1.5 million to support the establishment of the Centre for Social Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy at the NUS Business School in 2009. Let us put our hands together to welcome Mr. Chua on stage to deliver the welcome address. Mr. Chua, please. Professor Tan Chua Chuan, President of the National University of Singapore, Professor Lionel Wee, Vice Dean of Research, Associate Professor Ong Chang Wei, Vice Dean of International Re Relations and Special Duties, Associate Professor Esther Goh, Head of Social Work Department in US, Distinguished Speakers and Panelists, Representatives from the various social work uh, organizations and agencies, Practitioners in the social work field, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to everyone. And personally, I feel very honored to be here today with everyone in this nice, cozy auditorium. It heartens me to see such a good turnout today, despite, again, the weather being one of the factors. And I would like to certainly thank everyone for supporting and appreciating the significance behind the launch of this fund. I would also like to thank the distinguished speakers and panelists who are here with us today to help enhance our knowledge of the local, work, so the local social work practice research landscape. As co-trustee of the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Trust Fund, allow me now to just say a little bit more about the fund, how it came about and our objectives. However, before we get into that, I would like to just touch a little bit more on the general subject of philanthropy. Records of philanthropic endeavours 
in our nation go back to the 1800s, with education and health being two examples of key areas of focus. Active philanthropic giving and the establishment of several substantial foundations were already in place by 1965, which was the year when Singapore became independent. With basic provisions taken care of by the government, the philanthropic dollars contributed by foundations were often channeled into areas that were yet to be, governed, yet to be covered by government-funded services. Similar to other philanthropic foundations, the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Trust Fund was engaged to was established to engage in charitable purposes. My great-grandmother left behind a legacy of supporting the evolving needs of society, in her case, society of her day, which in terms of timing is about 100 years ago. The causes in education and health care in Singapore and abroad, which my great-grandmother believed in, continue to receive support through the trust set up in her name. It was interesting for us to discover, so, so our records as a family uh, go back up to a limited time, but it was interesting to discover in a recent uh, research that in 1922, uh, my great-grandmother laid the foundation stone for the first St. Andrew's uh, Hospital in Singapore. And that was an interesting connection that we didn't know. Um, we're still trying to find the silver trowel that was given to her uh, when, she, when she laid that foundation stone. And we're still trying to locate, locate the foundation stone if we can because the building is actually still standing today, although no longer functioning as a hospital. Um, the trowel is probably something that may have been, uh, may, may, may have been uh, probably acquired and, 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 uh, and, and circulated or, or passed around uh, in the Second World War, because uh, her house, uh, her, her house that she was living in, was left vacant uh, uh, um, during that during that period and was used as headquarters at that time. So, um, and 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 when we went back there, I, I guess the trial was one of the things that was uh, me was not left behind. So anyway, uh, it was interesting to know that that, that one of her one of one of her contributions, uh, lasting contributions, was was. Uh, uh, supporting the establishment of St. Andrew's Mission Hospital uh, 100 years ago. Um, for us, as an example today, our trust fund, uh, since 2012, uh, we have been supporting the non-profit work of children of Cambodia, uh, whose objectives are to reduce infant mortality in Cambodia, and we, support, and we have been part of the collaboration supporting that work by building a neonatal ward by encouraging the sharing of medical expertise and facilitating uh, the training of medical personnel. In addition to supporting such causes, we believe that there is a need for philanthropy to keep up with the times. So for myself, I had this opportunity after recognizing that not much was being done in the study of philanthropy in Asia, I approached the then Dean of the National University of Singapore Business School, this is about 11 years ago, with the idea of introducing philanthropy as a subject of mainstream study at university level. I thought the business school would be an ideal platform uh, for this uh, subject to be studied and perhaps uh, uh, delivered, uh, because as a university, uh, our business school has become well known as uh, not just Singapore business, not, not just in Singapore, but uh, in Asia as well. And since we teach our students how to make money, shouldn't we also be helping them to, to think about how to give it away as well. So, uh, as a result of some of that, as, as, as a result of that uh, discussion, as mentioned earlier, uh, it resulted in the uh, commencement of the Center for Social Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy in 2009. And today, we continue that work. Uh, the, the center has since been renamed the Asia Center for Social Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy. And uh, the, uh, the project that uh, personally, I, I'm hoping we will give uh, effort and attention and will be, will be also helpful to our, our nation and our society moving forward is a research on 200 years of philanthropy that will take us from 1819 until 2019. 
Today, I'm very pleased to announce the extension of this partnership and collaboration with NUS by supporting the NUS Social Work Department in their practice research efforts. I would like to thank, in particular, President of NUS, Professor Tan, for perhaps kicking off this initiative and this process when he communicated with me a couple of years ago about possible ways to collab collaborate with the NUS Social Work Department. Many Asian countries today are still looking to research in the social work sector uh, done in, in the Western world. I'm sure that there will still be valuable initiatives we can continue to draw from other countries. In one of my other areas of interest and work in my continuing work in mental health services, one recent area that we studied from the United States is the mobilizing of peers in our in-service delivery. Peers referring to persons in recovering from in, in, in recovery from uh, uh, mental illness, illness, having stabilized from treatment, and who now choose to help others in recovery. However, having said that, there's certainly value and opportunity to conduct research in the context of our society and our culture. It will help us better understand how the situation is in this current phase of our economic and social development. So therefore, may I encourage and invite all, so all charities, social work agencies, to take the opportunity and time to prepare to make the necessary adjustments so that social work practice, practices can be grounded in, uh, in, 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 in research and evidence-based research. I hope that all of us will find this morning's event helpful, meaningful. I trust you're looking forward to listening and learning from our speakers and panelists as much as I am. And may I conclude with sincerely wishing everyone success in your social work research and practice endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chua. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now have Professor Jill Menthor to deliver her lecture on practice research. Professor Jill is a professor of social work and a director of the Social Care Workforce Research Unit at King's College London. She has undertaken studies of social work practice and education and of services for people with dementia, homelessness services, of elder abuse, and family care. She works closely with practitioners on research into practice organisations in England, such as Making Research Count. We are very honoured to have her here today to share her thoughts and insights on practice research. Let us put our hands together to welcome Professor Jill on stage to deliver her lecture. Professor Jill, please. So, good morning everyone and thank you very much for inviting me here to your wonderful country and to this wonderful university. We know the University of Singapore very well as a great champion of social work and social work research and it's a great honour to be here among such distinguished guests and indeed everybody is a distinguished guest. Um, I'm going to touch on social work practice research which is something as my in, the lady introducing me said I'm interested in a bit, partly because I think it's the the cutting edge research in social work and indeed in many other professions and also because I think it has the capacity to make a very real difference to the lives of the people we intend to serve. You can see from this introductory slide that I'm based at King's College in London. King's does not run an undergraduate or a postgraduate qualifying course. Um, that's done by our, and neither do our neighbours, London School of Economics anymore. But we are in touch with many, many universities that do. And we also run a very large programme of continuing professional development. So every week we have connections with people in practice. And one of the great joys of my life is to go out and see people in practice rather than then coming to the university, uh, we go to them. And that is very constructive, I think, in many ways. I'm going to touch on a number of topics relevant, I hope, to today's proceedings. I'm going to discuss whether I think social workers are natural researchers. Um, perhaps you'll gather that I do. Um, I'm going to think about embedding research in practice and indeed embedding practice in research, which is not often done. I think there's a case for thinking about receptivity in research among social workers and among their managers and among the people who pay for their, in, their, their services. There is also something about being research literate, um, which doesn't mean swallowing great equations or algorithms, but being able to understand what people mean by something like a randomised control trial. 
I'll present some examples, um, which I find probably the most compelling um, bit of this presentation. And then I'll think about how researchers need to support people in practice, because it isn't just a one-way street. So I thought I'd start with a picture. This is a picture taken 10 days ago. We're all looking very smart um, because we are launching something called the James Lind Alliance into Priority Setting for Social Work Research with Adults. That is a very long title. But it's a title which is, has a great deal of meaning because for the first time in England, and indeed probably globally, we're trying to say what questions need to be answered in social work research with adults. In England, um, probably contrary to many other countries, children and adult services are split. You might think that's slightly um, curious because clearly children have families and families have children, but that just is the way our government is organized. We chose to focus on social work with adults and the lady in the front is our um, Australian born, but now um, British chief social worker for adults. And she has been asking for some time, what questions do we want to know? What matters? What's the priority? And we've set together a group that ha has its origins in health services research to say what are the key issues that need to be addressed. Because it's no good having a million questions, you need to find them down, and then indeed you need to persuade funders that they need researching. This process is going to take about 18 months, but it involves not just academics. In fact, the academics are in very much a minority. They're almost a protected species in this group. Um, we are probably outnumbered by service users and carers. We're certainly outnumbered by practitioners, and some, then there are some social work managers there as well. Um, there are representatives from the British Association of Social Workers, the professional grouping, and the academics are there really to serve and to ask the difficult questions. One of the great joys about being an academic researcher is that you can ask the difficult questions and your job is not so much at risk or your reputation so damaged by appearing to be rather stupid. So, moving from that, and I think you can see that I'm quite keen Research is not always a question of um, getting out there and doing experiments and asking people difficult things, but actually a process of thinking and reflection. I'm going to offer three reasons why I think social workers are probably natural researchers. To me, having read applications for social work programs for many years, um, numbers and numbers of them, what stands out, I think, is that many social workers have in them a sense of curiosity. They want to know the why, and they want to know in what circumstances, and they want to know what is the effect. They've got a curiosity gene within them. They want to know why things occur to one family and not to another, why something that seems to work for one child does not work for another, why something that appears to be a good system can often have its drawbacks. So I think that is always what I look for in research in my colleagues and in my PhD students is that sense of curiosity because that keeps you going in the quiet of the night. It keeps you going to when your motivation dips, when things get very difficult, and also you can remember why you started on the endeavor that you are embarking upon. Social work often has to discuss whether it's an art or a science or part of the humanities, and probably the get-out clause is that it combines all three, that everybody in social work has a great sense of humanity, but they are reflective of the sciences, both the clinical but also the social sciences, and increasingly now, I think many of them recognise that the arts have a very under, um, underserved role in social work, um, but the arts have a lot to offer. They, are often, they have much to offer in terms of resilience. They have much to offer in terms of creativity. They have much to offer in terms of healing. And we ignore them at our peril. So by arts, I don't mean the great arts of classical music and, um, and um, painting and so on on their own. I mean things which are very popular in British social workers at the moment, such as knitting. Knitting is an art as well as a science, <laughs> and indeed quite difficult. Um, thirdly, I think social workers are, aren't afraid to challenge. That doesn't mean that they're hypercritical, although their colleagues might think they are sometimes, 
but their, quest, their curiosity and their sense of investigative um, journalism, their sense of um, trying to lift up stones to see what is really going on underneath, means that they have the ability to challenge, and that is what we want in research. That is where we look for the people who will say, um, this theory doesn't work in practice. My experience is very different from that which is reported in the professional or the academic press. Um, I don't think that that is the outcome that we are looking for. It is something more different for people. Outcome is a great word that's used a lot in the UK at the moment, and I presume in Singapore, uh, but there is debate over whether or not an outcome is exactly shared sometimes by service users and carers and by professionals, and we'll touch on that later. How do we know this, that social workers are like this? Other professionals tell us so. We know a little bit about what professionals think of each other. For many social workers, it's not entirely complimentary, um, but when they do talk about us, we're quite pleased to be noticed. So embedding research into practice isn't easy. Here are some of the things that people tell me why my research isn't very helpful. Um, they say that it's hard to translate to practice because it's not specific enough, that somehow work done in one hospital or in one prison or in one family centre cannot translate to another. And I think we have to listen to that and try and understand what is behind it. I'm not pretending it does, but I do think it does apply more than many people think. And indeed, I think there are many international comparisons to be made that are extremely helpful. Researchers are often criticised, particularly in the social sciences, for not being conclusive. They will say, it indicates, it suggests, it appears that, when people would really have a conclusion which says, do this, do that, in these circumstances and spend this amount of money on something. But life isn't very conclusive. Our families are not concluding organisations. Um, our emotions are not conclusive. It fits with the task and the um, ambience of social work to offer that multifaceted approach to life which sees things from different perspectives and at different times and knows that there is a lot of change. Social work research is also accused of not being um, um, contextual, that somehow or other it doesn't understand the greater context in which a pra practitioner works with an individual or their family. Clearly that's so because when we're writing about one intervention um, we have to take the context into account but if we spent all our time on context we wouldn't get down to the population or the problem or indeed the intervention. But we know, I think, in social work that context and indeed culture eats interventions for breakfast, as we say. It is very important in social work to know where the family are living, to know the neighbourhood, but also to know the past. And I think that story we heard today about the past and its influence of the, on, of the past on families' lives is very compelling isn't it, about the way that our past affects our families and it affects the societies in which we live. We run, uh, help run the Social Work History Network in um, my college, um, which is a national organisation, and I think it's one, of, it's one of the things I'm most proud because the History Network has brought together the past of social work in England, um, it mixed as it is, and it is not entirely self-congratulatory. And I'm sure at the university here, you have a history of social work, your alumni, your teachers, and what was taught and why, and how valuable that is to bring it all together. And equally in England, we re recently had 100 objects from social work displayed in a museum. Uh, most of you in practice can think what that might be. A lot of people produced memos, um, they also produced um, administration documents, but sometimes they produced letters from clients and letters from people with whom they'd worked, saying what a difference that had made to their lives. And again, I think those visible, sometimes artistic representations are really helpful for the profession. Other criticisms of social work research are that it is difficult to change one person's practice without changing the whole system. 
and indeed social work can think systems. We can talk to our colleagues in the business school and other systems theorists about how systems need to change because it may not be the individual practitioner who needs to change, it's the system within which they work. And here is a criticism that comes from our medical colleagues, but also is applicable to social work. That is that from bench to bedside takes far too long. That means, of course, in medical contexts, it's about a new procedure or a new drug or a new intervention in some ways. In social work, I suppose our equivalent of, with, of that would be from pilot to procedures takes far too long um, and thing for, for, so that things change. We need to speed up that process, but we also need to listen carefully to the process because we probably learn a lot more from feasibility studies um, than we think, rather than rushing ahead with all practitioners going, we, knew, we told you it wouldn't work. Then lastly, research in practice is everybody's baby and therefore it's nobody's baby. And one of the things we've learned from the UK is having people who are champions of research who see that their role is to advocate within their organization for the use of research, but for them to remain fully grounded in practice. And we're currently running a program on that at the moment. Oh, my slide has slipped a little, um, partly to show you that I do like going to the cinema. Um, and, and also uh, what we would call La La Land, a land perhaps of imagination, not too much in touch with reality. So part of the problem that we address in the UK, and I think you may find some resonance with in Singapore, is that research doesn't get embedded in practice. Pilots or experiments, um, in the UK we've also termed such things demonstrator sites, um, don't, are often set in an unreal world with no competing priorities. Um, a British social scientist said recently that all pilots work, otherwise they don't go ahead. And so you learn only too a little from pilots if they're not set in the very real world of competing priorities, limited resources, and people who are not always enthusiastic about what's being suggested. So we have been experimenting for a long time in our child welfare with something called signs of safety. And we know that in pilots it works very well. In the real world, this is um, a way to help children who are perhaps being abused and maltreated um, needs to be set in that real world of acute pressures, of staff shortages, and pressures from the courts to get the case, um, cases cleared up as soon as possible. Experiments also can be very short term. In social work, we very rarely have longitudinal research. We have shortitudinal research. We try and think that two months of something will make a real difference to custom and practice that have been around for, many, for several years, that the office culture will suddenly be able to change, that having a meeting means that everybody will do things differently. We know that things don't work like that. I should have said that um, experiments are short term in the UK and they often founder on the long term problems of our systems, IT systems. I'm sure you don't have those problems here. We have great problems in re-engineering re re IT systems to make thing, to put in, um, to accept changes that are going on. That takes a long time. That's the, our bench to bedside problem. Equally, we know that people's research questions are not always clear or applicable to practice. Um, people will come in with research questions that practitioners don't recognize that they need to try and think about in multiple ways before they can make sense of them in the, their real world. And the distance between practice and research is always to be um, drawn in mind. And then lastly, what's the good? What is a good outcome in social work? We know from other researchers, particularly from our health and education colleagues, that sometimes their outcomes are not the same as ours. I worked on a long study on children's social work where it appeared to me that the main outcome appeared to be whether the child had been to the dentist. I'm sure that was really, really valuable for the child and their teeth and probably made a great difference. But probably the social work's responsibility was not to be the person who encouraged dental care. 
it was something a little bit more profound and a little bit more difficult than that. But that seemed to be the main outcome that we could get a grip on. Secondly, an example is from older people's services, where I do a lot of work, is that for many people, a negative outcome is seen as a move to a care home, um, a residential home, a nursing home. Whereas for families, sometimes that is the best thing that can happen. It will save relationships. The person will not be neglected. The person will be happier. They'll have a better quality of life. But if our colleagues see admission to long-term care institution as the problem, then we in social work have to work around that, and sometimes the research is not meaningful to us. And just to draw another example from child protection, to reduce neglect is an outcome that, of course, everybody would want. But how do you measure reductions in neglect? What is the outcome that you could help to build up the uh, series of indicators that that was no longer happening. So agreement needs to be cast there. And practitioners, I think, have a huge role in that, in saying that outcomes are multiple and various within social work, and not always those of our colleagues. And here is an example of something we don't see much nowadays. It's a book. <laughs> There, is a great, there are great shortages of books now. People are keeping them at home, working in open plan offices within universities. Um, no longer can we reach to our shelves. But they are important, and they're just there as a, a legacy. So being research receptive is something that I think social workers, in, social workers who are in practice need to address very carefully and think about, are they receptive? as well as being curious, sometimes cynical, and sometimes critical. The questions that people ask me are these, typically. Why should a social worker bother to look at research? It won't tell me the answer. And indeed, it will appear rather distant from what I will do. To resolve that problem, probably the last thing I would give them is a book, a book of theory um, or an article, um, because that will not get through that slight resistance. We're working a lot in the UK on things like tweets and blogs. I never thought I would be able to say those things, but we do. And it is astounding how many people will read a tweet and um, follow that up compared to being given an article, um, either electronically, um, that they won't, they won't open the page. But a tweet and a blog will entice them in if you can think of the right 140 characters to do so. <laughs> Less authority, more authenticity. And I think that old status of the academic and the researchers knowing everything and passing our knowledge on has really changed. We are learning from practitioners their language, their interests, their obsessions, and have to reflect that in the work way they do. So here underneath in the italics are some words that people use about academic research. Um, it is too long. 80,000 uh, 80, uh, word research reports will only be read by your mother. Um, <laughs> it is too waffly. Sentences which go on for at least 10 lines and contain many subordinate clauses and don't really get to the point are too, much, are too many. There is too much in social work report, reporting the methods. If you want your conference to fall asleep, have several slides of methods, most of which are unintelligible and in too small writing. And social work researchers are guilty of this. Again, there's that indecisive, it all depends, um, it would indicate, it appears that. Say what we mean um, and, and say, we don't know. And of course, most researchers end with two things. More research is needed. <laughs> and the second one, in words that you could probably encapsulate, is please send me a check. Because it is more research is needed, and I would like to do it. Um, so we have all read those articles. I thought now that we'd turn to three people who I know well. Um, because I've worked with them as practitioner researchers and introduce you to them. The first is Elaine, who came um, on a course and wanted to do her thesis, her dissertation, 
as a part-time student and didn't know what to do. And so in conversation within her own work setting, she talked about working in a care home when a resident with Alzheimer's or dementia thinks another resident is their spouse and starts to hold hands with them and generally appear affectionate. Nobody was worried about that. That was nice, people were happy, if, the, if both parties were happy to sit there watching TV, holding hands, appearing to have some, um, some quality of life from that. The trouble and the puzzles arose about what you did when the partner of one of those residents came and saw their wife or their husband of 50, 60 years holding hands with another person. What do you think the relative is? I think the relative, as Elaine said, we're worried that they're going to be upset. We're worried that they won't let their husband or wife come to the facility anymore. We're worried that they think we're up to, we're encouraging bad or immoral behavior. Uh, we don't know what to do. She thought that in her small area of South London, this was just a one problem that nobody else had ever faced before. And she spent some time talking about it, whose problem it was, what was going on, was it anything that staff should do, um, how, how, how should they respond? And so partly one of the things we did was say, do you know, Elaine, I think some other people might have done some work on this. And she did spend some time looking at the literature in a really scientific way and discovered that while a lot of this behavior might be seen as challenging behavior and sometimes seen as overtly sexualized behavior in dementia, there were numbers of researchers all around the world. Spain was one, one example, Australia, the United States, whereby people had said, yes, we've had such a situation happening and this is how we've dealt with it. So without having to do any research, Elaine found that that was not just a problem in her care home in that small part of South London, but was a problem that was widely shared. Um, it, it wasn't the major problem, but people were writing about it. So what did Elaine do? Elaine decided she would like to do some research on this topic, but we thought about it in terms of the ethics of doing it. Um, how could she do this? What should she do? Could she talk to family carers without being uh, very intrusive? Could she make them worry? Um, all the ethical points that you do in research. And so I suggested to her that she used what we call vignettes, which is just a, um, a smart word for saying it's a little story. And we gave these little, she gave, devised a little story about somebody living in a care home who's um, whose wife came in one day and found her husband holding hands with another woman. Um, and she talked to and recruited some caregivers and said, this is a story about somebody else. What do you think? What, uh, um, what would you do? What do you think the staff should do? What do you think um, the, uh, the people around this area should do? And sought their views. So she wasn't dealing with their own problems too, sen too insensitively, but probably address some of the things that they had thought about themselves. What did Elaine do with this? Elaine brought it all together, as you do. She wrote it up, as you do. And she has been delivering training to her colleagues about the management of difficult, apparently ethical dilemmas. So there is no solution. There's no answer, yes, no. It's a dilemma that perhaps staff teams need to face and she talked to people about how to manage that and what carers said they would want to happen in that circumstance. As a result, Elaine has produced two articles in an international journal on dementia, probably the first ever from um, this perspective. So she's made a global difference. And she's also, I think, comfortable now that when she and her colleagues encounter dilemmas, she has a way of thinking about them and thinking them through that has equipped her for the future. Here's another person, Rebecca, who said to me in, her, in one conversation, if patient passports are such a good idea, why don't we use them? Patient passports are something that you might be familiar with in other terms. They're used in um, clinical settings and between clinical settings and homes, whereby information about a person that they can't say and they can't communicate 
is written down. And we think of it as a term of, in the term of a passport. So that, for example, a child with special needs who is profoundly disabled and can't communicate needs about how they like to be treated, what they like to be called, what they respond to, what they're allergic to. Um, though all that information is contained in one document. Fantastic idea, but it does not work in practice. And you can probably think multiple reasons why that does not work. So Rebecca wanted to find out why. She talked to people in that area, and a lot of social work research is about talking to people. They thought that they were a good idea, but could give multiple reasons why they weren't used. They got lost. They didn't always have the right information. What was a patient passport in one area was a totally different document in another area. Um, nobody agreed what their content should be. Somehow or other, they didn't fit with the electronic systems that people are now operating. So good idea in principle, in practice, they all fell through. Uh, so what did Rebecca do? She thought about it with a theory. And this is something I suppose that academics can do, is bring a theory into, into play and say, Rebecca, I think you're talking about normalization process theory. And she looked at me as though I was mad. <laughs> normalization process theory did not figure on her radar. But it's a way of saying, why don't things work when we think they should work? And let's try and get together those ideas and think about them, a bit like force field analysis, which I'm sure people here will be familiar with. So we have not changed the world on patient passports, but we know now that instead of simplistic answers about why people don't use them, that they're, they're careless, that um, they can't be bothered, there are much more complicated system-wide issues about their use, and Rebecca will, will continue to work in this area. Lastly is Claire. Claire took a puzzle, and she also looked at people who are forgotten and sometimes invisible in care services. She said, what do our domestic staff, by that she meant the cleaners and the people who serve meals and the cooks, do for our clients? Um, what do they think is going on here? Um, what, what's going on? We found when we did the literature review that there is almost no research on people who we would call cleaners, domestics and porters. They don't exist. Except when Claire talked to them, she worked out that they probably spend more time with users of her service than any professional. They help them with food, they help them to the toilet, they help them with many other things. They know that individual very well, but nobody ever touches upon what they know and indeed how they use what they know in their behaviour with the individuals and their families. So this was a great joy to touch upon something that's new, to touch upon something that um, other people thought probably wasn't a problem, but certainly was a puzzle. And as a result of that, Claire has asked that members of um, staff, such as cleaners, the porters and the domestics, come to the training that's offered to everybody else. And they have appreciated that, I hope, also because, of course, as cleaners, domestics and porters, they're very likely to be family caregivers. So any training given to them at work obviously applies outside work and we hope makes a difference to their social situations as well. What did these three examples have in common? I think they uh, have four things, four Ps. They talk about other people, not just individual service users and carers, about teams, about lo localities, about um, the institutions where they work. They were pressing problems or dilemmas, but they weren't the immediate problems. And one of the things we know in research is that do not give us managerial decisions and say that those are research. If you want to open or close or change something immediately, then research is not the game in town. That should be done afterwards. They were puzzles. Um, they were, that was the question and why the curiosity was there. And then lastly, of course, as an academic or researcher, what I hoped to make, help to make them do was that it was possible to do them in a short amount of time um, by taking small areas to study and not doing a five million pound project. Lastly, then I'll talk about how researchers probably need to change. 
And most things in life can be summed up by Winnie the Pooh and his conversations. So I can commend you to that. Are academics always easy to work with? Probably not. We have to admit that. And a fund such as this will probably have to change the behavior of academics and researchers as much as it will have to change the behavior of practitioners and their managers. Academics and researchers often say they need time. They have the time, um, but they don't have as many demands on their time as people in practice. So this is one quandary that will need to be addressed. People in practice probably think they know what to do and argue that the amount of preparation for research is probably too long. We talk about going to ethics committees, preparing protocols, thinking about in great detail our interview schedules or our surveys and so on, and we take a lot of time over those. Why or why so much time needs to be taken? Because it does. Because one mistake early on carries on and gets magnified as a research study continues. And then academics, of course, will always like to complicate things by saying there is another way of thinking about it, another way of doing it, have you thought of this, and does uh, the, the sums add up? So this initiative, which um, is slightly obscured here, is this initiative will test academics too. It is not only about uh, testing practitioners. So end thoughts from me. This is a global initiative, the one that's being launched today. We, the rest of the social work global community will be looking to you to see how it works out, what its successes are, the problems it encounters, and how those are addressed. And what a joy it is to be here today to mark this global initiative. It is a huge investment, and that is important too, really about the confidence that people have in social work in Singapore, that it is deserving of this investment and can take its place with other professions within the university and globally. We need, of course, to ensure that expectations are carefully managed. It is all too easy to say it will change the world when it probably will only make a, sl um, a minor change, good as though that will be. And square that with the problem of having high ambitions, but also accepting that there will be some problems along the line and some researchers and some practitioners uh, will not um, make the, uh, take advantage of what's uh, available because life is generally like that. But I am confident that the building blocks are in place for a huge and impressive program of work. There is enormous stakeholder commitment as evidenced in this room and outside from what I've heard. And I can say rather um, grandly, but on honestly, that on behalf of everybody in social work outside Singapore, we do wish the, this initiative all the best, and we wish you very much uh, that it goes ahead well and look forward to hearing of its developments. Thank you. Mr. Keith Chua, trustee of Mrs. Lee Chung Wan Trust Fund. Mrs. Chua and Ms. Chua. Thank you for taking time to be with us this morning. Professor Jill Mentor, our special invited speaker from King's College London. Friends and fellow social workers, a very good morning. First of all, let me express my deep appreciation to the Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Trust Fund for the generous gift of 2.37 million which will resource the NUS Department of Social Work in partnering frontline practitioners to conduct social work research that will inform and support practitioner decision making as well as client service provision. This is indeed a timely development. Social work is increasingly being recognized as a profession that contributes solutions to the social problems that confront Singapore. With this recognition and trust given by society, comes the responsibility for us, social workers, to conduct our practice in a way that is acutely attuned to the changing needs with careful thoughts given to how helpful these solutions are. 
Practitioner's engagement in practice research is an integral component of accountable practice. If social workers do not engage in research, then we have to rely on other professions to generate knowledge for us, something that we have been doing for a long time. On the other hand, we are mindful not to overly elevate the status of research findings such, such that they encroach on professional autonomy or override practice instincts. Instead, research evidence and practice wisdom should build on each other to form knowledge that guide us to be critical thinkers in program planning, resource planning, program design, training of social workers, and policy formulation. The Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Endowed Research Fund is carefully governed by a steering committee that charts the overall direction of the funds and ensures the relevance and long-term impact of the projects. The committee approves research budgets and the use of the funds. The selection committee, on the other hand, consists of field and research experts who will assess the research proposals submitted by applicants. The selection committee is supported by a resource panel which consists of service providers, service users, that is our clients, and policy specialists from respective fields to comment on the relevance and feasibility of the research project in question. In addition to feasibility, potential impact, possibility of being translated into practice, as well as training or teaching materials, adherence to ethical principle in research practice is another critical evaluation criterion to which the selection committee pays keen attention. Consolidating the evaluation by research and field experts, the selection committee puts forward the shortlisted projects to the steering committee, which will make the final decision on the choice of awardees and the allocation of research funds. Depending on the viability and impact of the projects, successful applicants can expect to receive funding that ranges from 20 to 30,000 for each practice research project, which has to be completed within three years. The first call of applications for the funds will be announced in May 2008. 2018. I'm sorry, May 2018. Applicants must be practicing social workers with a keen interest to do practice research. They will also have to secure endorsement and support from their employers. Successful applicants will be matched with researchers from the NUS Department of Social Work to partner them as investigators for the research projects. The uniqueness of this research grant is that it requires the practitioner research team, practitioner researcher team, to engage relevant stakeholders in the research process, which our president has mentioned, including the conceptualization, implementation, analysis, and eventually the utilization of research findings. From now to next May, when the first call for application will be announced, the Mrs. Lee Chun Guan Endowed Research Fund will organize two public lectures to raise the awareness of social work practice research, as well as engage practitioners to start thinking of different creative research ideas that can contribute to the quality of our practice. Even simple ideas, as long as they are ethically sound. The public lectures will build up to a National Social Work Practice Research Conference in next May. Just as our president, Professor Tan Cho Chuan, has mentioned, 
the research expertise of faculty members in the Department of Social Work positions us strategically to complement practitioners' grounded experience in conducting practice research. Indeed, in addition to research expertise, strong bonds between the two are vital to the achievement of the donor's mission in conducting impactful practice research. And I believe such strong bonds do exist between us and our alumni, many of whom are social workers in all fields of practice and seated here this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited about the potential collaboration between us in the days ahead. On that note, we very much look forward to receiving your applications when the calls open next May. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goh. We will now proceed with the dialogue session. Please join me in welcoming back Professor Jill Manthorpe. She will be joined by Associate Professor Corinne Goh, who held several key appointments at the previous Ministry of Community Development, Youth and Sports, before joining the Social Work Department as an Associate Professor of the Practice Track, and Dr. Crystal Lim, a Master Medical Social Worker at Singapore General Hospital, who has a PhD in Social Work and Master of Arts in Bioethics from University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Rosalind Au, who was our recent past Head of Department and has many years of experience working with low-income families in Singapore, will be chairing the session. Dr. Au, please. Good morning, everybody. So pleased to see that there are still so many people around after the tea break. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't want to spend a lot of time doing the introduction. Uh, as you know, I'm Roslyn Ao. I think many of you already know me. Um, um, Professor Mantrop, which you have already heard earlier this morning. Um, Corinne, whom everybody should know in this room. <laughs> if you don't, or I read her profile that somebody had kindly put together for us. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through that. And Crystal, I think uh, those of you in the medical and healthcare services will know her well. But for the rest of us, uh, please read her profile. She's the Master um, MSW at the Singapore General Hospital and has many uh, years of work experience as well as um, a PhD, I think, from Pittsburgh. So um, what we want to do during the dialogue session today is I think primarily for my colleagues in the panel to um, comment and respond on uh, Jew's talk earlier this morning um, with reference to the local context. And also for everyone here to think about what you would like to say about the fund, the objectives, and how you are going to th think about using this fund in your own practice research in the future. Because what we want to do is to encourage people to think about what they can do um, in using this fund to actually enhance their own practice. Um, you may not uh, have to confine yourself to actually thinking about like evaluating your own practice to make it better. Maybe you have some ideas about some new but small um, issues that you have confront <coughs> that has been confronting you in your work and you don't really have the funding, the manpower to actually pursue that and um, explore that a bit further. So you can think about that as well. So without um, prolonging the introduction, I think I want to start off by just asking um, our panelists, uh, Crystal and um, Corinne, to respond to uh, Jill's talk first, and then we open it to the floor for you to um, you know, make your comments and ask for clarification about projects and whatever issues that you have in your head now about the fund and using the fund. So I'd like to invite maybe Corinne to start off first. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, wow, I love to hear that. Well, actually, um, this research uh, grant is really very timely because as it is, I my five years in NUS here, I'm already sensing the energy being built up to do practice research, really. Some of my collaborators are here, actually, saw them. Okay, I... Thank you, Prof. Uh, Jill, for the very informative lecture. 
Um, I wanted to start off by actually asking you some questions, is that all right? Some clarification maybe because uh, the lecture, you may not have uh, the time to elaborate on that. I'm curious to know, uh, what is the social impact of practice research at the organisational level and also in terms of policy enhancement development in the, in the UK setting? The uh, reason why I'm asking this is because uh, I'm thinking that while the social workers are passionate at the ground, look, asking questions, trying to figure out how best to work, uh, I wonder how can we do better in terms of translating the, the ground research at the organisational level and perhaps carry it through at the policy level. So we would appreciate if you could share with us uh, what, what's going on in the UK system that, that we can learn from it. Thanks. Great, thank you for that question. Um, it's a question which really lends itself to a research study saying how do issues in practice, <laughs> what Im impact have they made? But I think maybe one example is a, a good one, and this is probably before practice research as a term was invented. It was uh, the concern of one social worker in London that he saw and he came across many, many cases where he thought that older people were being mistreated, mis neglected by their relatives. He knew through his training, and we're talking about somebody in the 1970s, he knew through his training that there was such a thing as child maltreatment, but he'd never heard of it referred to in relation to other people, particularly older people. And so he got in contact um, with the, a charitable organization. He wrote up the cases that he found in a very obscure part of London called Enfield, which is not the center of anywhere. But he came across cases. He put an advert in our local social work a magazine that used to come in a plastic wrapper on everybody's desk in the 1970s. He put a letter in and asked for people to send them to send him examples of cases. And he got together a number of cases and he published a very small book, not with an academic publish publisher and not with any university backing, and it was called Old Age Abuse. And that, I think, was the start of our realisation in England and the UK, that there was such a thing as the mistreatment and neglect of older people, that it wasn't confined to children. I think that's a good example of practice research. Um, it would have been great if the academics had suddenly realized uh, that this was going on. They did very quickly. A geriatrician, a nurse, and a social worker read that book and started to do work and research on that area. But to me, the telling example of that is that he thought about his cases and he thought in a way that was um, horizontal thinking. Could I apply what I've learned from child protection, child safeguarding to this other area? Does it really exist or is it only happening in Enfield that um, people are being not so nice as they could be? Um, and he thought long and hard. His name is Mervyn Eastman. He's still around this time. Um, he's now retired, of course, and he got to be the director of his local social services department. But I think he made a big difference in drawing his pr practice into research, into policy, and probably in changing the way that social workers nowadays in England think when they see something and they have an instinct that um, things are not right, that perhaps this is a case where they can make a difference to the quality of somebody's life. So that, I think, is hopefully the sort of example you're thinking about. Yeah, he, good for Mervyn. He did a lot, um, and he's a really nice man. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jill. Um, I suppose for us as academics, maybe sometimes, you know, our idea about social impact is more about indicators. You know, like, what is it exactly, you know? Uh, how do we exactly look at... Um, you know, what makes, you know, the social impact, I guess. Uh, maybe, Crystal, you'd like to... I just... Um, well, I'm really excited about this fund, and, um, but I just want to um, ask you, how was the initial experience like in the United Kingdom when, when, um, when there was this emphasis on practice research? Um, was there more, um, particularly with regard to the uh, practitioners, the social work practice practitioners, was there more apprehension? Was there enthusiasm? Um, because I'm just uh, wondering how perhaps that may mirror 
if any at all, um, our likely experience ahead. Yeah. So we've been involved in a fund which was very, very small and worked in the Children's Workforce Development Council um, where practitioners teamed up with academics. It was very small in comparison to this. Every social worker is different. Everybody knows that. They've all got different DNA. And some people will want to do big studies. Some people will want to do very small studies. Some people will do something we don't think is a study. Um, it's very variable. <laughs> so, <laughs> and some people will just like to look at data. Um, because, believe it or not, some social workers can manage numbers. Um, <laughs> so that depends. The people... But I suppose one of the things that I hope this will do is make the profession more receptive to research so that it will participate in research. Social workers are not only perhaps doing research, but they have to help researchers. We do this a number of ways in where I work. We give everybody who takes part in one of our studies a certificate of participation in research so that it counts towards their continuing professional development. And in our country, you have to do 40 hours of um, CPD every year as a social worker. So one hour of one interview will help you do that. But we think it's really important for people to respond to research as well as carry it out. Not everybody wants to do research, but a good interview with somebody who's reflective about what they do. A good survey completed with somebody who can tell us that actually most of the time they spend uh, driving rather than seeing clients uh, is very valuable information. So I think it's really important not always to see everybody doing research, but enabling people to say that my hour that I spend talking to a researcher, filling in a form, uh, doing, uh, uh, answering a vignette, um, taking part in a focus group is time well spent um, and not a waste of time. Because there is that pressure in social work, isn't there, that if you're not on the phone, if you're not seeing people, it can't be work. But actually, taking part in a group discussion is very valuable. So again, I think that's part of the capacity building that this fund will do, is to say to people, your experience is so important for research. Um, don't negate that. Yeah, thank you, um, Corinne, Crystal, and you. We'll come back to you again later. But now I want to open the uh, discussion to the floor. I think I really like what you said about social workers and natural researchers. Because we, um, you know, as social workers, you're in touch with reality, with the uh, daily living of the people that you work with. Um, you have access to information that other people are not privy to. And, um, you know, you in, your, in the course of your work, you have earned the trust of the people that you work with, all the different stakeholders and all that. So I'm going to open the floor to you now to let you ask any question you like about research in social work, practice research, and whatever you have in your head as a result of your own experience. So please... Um, Introduce yourself, tell us your name and uh, which agency you're from and what um, you know, you'd like to hear from the panel. Uh, please use the mic, thank you. You can ask about the fun too, by the way. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm a social worker at Issue Community Hospital. Um, sorry, is this probably a quite a, a basic level question, uh, but since we're talking about practice research, oftentimes when as a, at, at the ground when I, I have a question, first thing I want to do uh, is to look at the literature. Um, but as uh, at, on the ground, we don't usually have access to all the journals. I Google. And Google usually turns up the journals from 1970s, 1980s that are already public access. So that's one, one practical thing I, I face. I'm wondering, uh, I understand that uh, when I try to access NUS database, a bit hard, like even as an alumni, it's, it's quite hard to get uh, the full range. It's different when, when if I'm a student or uh, doing some, something, research with NUS, I have the full access. So I can't do a very quick uh, literature review and find out 
what's available and what's not, whether this topic is worth doing or not. Uh, sometimes in discussions, we can just quickly find out. So I'm just wondering uh, that if that's ac accessible to us, uh, through the association or through some 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 other channel, that will greatly facilitate uh, the thinking of uh, of research questions. Uh. So I'm, I I don't have an answer. I, I don't know whether this has been addressed before. So I'm just wondering, uh, especially what the department thinks of this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Victor. That's uh, actually a very real challenge for almost everyone that we spoke with. Um, I think it's a systems issue, institutional issue. Um, we probably have to uh, look at it. Um, maybe through the grant, people can get access, you know, because they are working with us in the department. But I mean, for practitioners, we will probably have to, um, you know, see what we can do, um, you know, with this systems issue. But what I like to do, at this point, as can I to ask can you I just how add, add to that, uh. um, and I, which is why this fund is really something um, is really beneficial and exciting because you get to collaborate with the faculty, and I believe the faculty understands our constraints. And much as you want to provide them a better um, scope of the problem, um, but I, I, I just, I'm just thinking that the preliminary discussion could uh, perhaps even help you access the information. Because as a practitioner, you have limited. It's just like when I came back from Pittsburgh, I still had access as today, it was wonderful. And when that died, so did my intellectual mind. We almost perished. <laughs> and, and, and so, and it helped that I was, I began teaching in NUS Duke and then I have access. So this is really a systems problem, um, which is why, you know, um, this, uh, Mrs. Lee Chung Guan Research uh, Fund, uh, with the collaboration of the faculty, will help. Yeah. Mm. You want to ask a question? Yeah, or, 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 or. Because I kind of uh, realized that yeah, NCSS does provide that facility for journal search and all that. Anyone from NCSS would like to comment so that the, the sector knows about the resources, <laughs> even at the ground, the first cut, you know, about getting some information. I'm sure NUS will have a lot more uh, kind of good journals that we could dig up from, but I'm at the ground level. You know. Just a quick comment. Yep. Nobody is more flattered than an academic by having somebody who wants to read your article. <laughs> <laughs> and such is the um, global reach that if I get a request from somebody in Alabama, Australia, um, the Antarctic, uh, for my article, I will send them one. So never, I think one of the things that social workers are quite good at is asking for things um, for their clients, but ask for yourselves. If you see an article and it's behind a paywall, uh, just ask the author. They will be delighted and to read it. As, apart from your, their mother, you will be the only person probably to have, <laughs> to have read that article. So, so please don't hesitate to ask. The second is to say that in the UK, because of our research assessment exercise, all our articles are now going to be available free online. And I think if the UK does that, um, other places will follow. And um, third point is to researchers. Sometimes, just when you have written an article, also write a report um, which is behind, has no paywall. Um, it will get read and will get cited as well. So I think those are three practical strategies uh, for answering your question and remembering that people do love to be asked to send you their article. <laughs> Thank you, Ju. Actually, I was going to ask her what, what they do in the UK with this problem. NCSS, please. Yes. Thank you, Corinne. Um, so NCSS, if you're a member of uh, the National Council of Social Service, you can go into the VWO corner and you get access to all the database. We are on ProQuest, actually. Or you can go to gatherhere.com. Um, and Gather Here is a resource hub for all um, social workers or anyone in the social service agencies who are members of um, NCSS. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Ross. Any other comment? Um, I'm Isabel. I'm the secretariat for the fund. I just wanted to let you know that we are also running clinics in the last quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year. And that's also the time for you to come and talk to Professor Yen Shaw about your potential research project and get guidance. There will be about six clinics. So we will please sign up and then 
come and see Professor Yen Shaw. Thank you. There was somebody else from the floor who wanted to make a comment on this issue about um, journal articles and access. Hi, good morning. I'm Martin from uh, Care Corner. It's not about journal articles, but uh, uh, my comment or the question is from now till next year, May, while we put in our applications, what can we do to enhance or raise the level of interest in practice research in our organizations? So I'm, I'm just curious how UK does it. Thank you. I think um, asking the academics to come and work in the organization is good maybe not in a formal lecture sense but to problem solving case discussions those sort of approaches um, and asking the academics not to come with a set title but really to do some exploration and facilitation of events is often what we find helpful um, i think in the uk we um, not everybody is good at this. Some people like to stay in what we would call an ivory tower. So I don't want you to think the UK is, is fantastic. Um, it, we're not fantastic. Um, but we do recognise that for practice research um, and research to practice are interlinked. And we must do our, our best to communicate what public money is being spent on um, research, uh, philanthropic money is being spell, spent on research, to make a difference in people's lives. And also because it is much better to work um, with some confidence that um, the slightly crazy thing you're suggesting is done has an evidence base. So for example, um, we have some fantastic randomized control trials now about group work, about memory stimulation, which is the only answer to helping people with dementia. No drug on the planet has the effect of working in a group and doing structured reminiscence work. But for anybody else, that appears a bit soft and fluffy. So we, as practitioners, we need to have that evidence base because resources and um, so on get diverted to other sectors. So in many ways, practitioners will benefit from this. Um, they're probably doing it anyway, but to arm them with the shield of um, evidence it works very well, I think. In the UK, we have straightened times at the moment. We have what we call austerity. So it's even more important in the UK for people to argue that what works has to be cost effective. And that, I suppose, is something that we've not mentioned today, is about how economics needs to fill in, needs to be part of studies, I think. We need to know what things cost in order to work out whether they're cost effective. Because things can be terribly effective, but they can be unaffordable. And we need to be able to, in all research, measure the impact um, in cost terms as well. Social workers know that. They know the difference that income and finance makes to the lives of their service users. So I think they should be very receptive to taking on board that costs are important. They're not the only thing, but without them, we can't manage to do to make research compelling. I think some of my colleagues here are not speaking out, but I will speak on their behalf. This is a very common question I kind of like, when I interact with the social workers at the ground, the struggles they face in carrying out practice research is that whether the management endorses it as part of the, the load, workload allocation, uh, because sometimes, you know, in social practice, when there's a fire, you have to put out a fire, you know what I mean? That a case in, in dire straits, we have to go in and help the client resolve the crisis. And therefore, most times, research takes a back seat. Right? So I see my friends at the ground struggling with um, doing it officially in the agency, getting that recognition, uh, and then grappling with um, ground practice. So perhaps you could share with us, um, in the UK system, any wisdom about how we should handle this tension at the ground? with the organization. Thank you. I do think that having that necessity in UK social work for people to do 40 hours continuing professional development has helped. And I don't know how much you have to do here, but um, it may not be as... Hmm? 
80 hours. So even more chance to do research then. <laughs> that is a long period of time. Yes. No, um, no, a year. All right. Mm, yes. So that is one example. I think for academics as well, it's also persuading managers. Rather than the practitioners persuading managers, it's our role to perhaps produce, as we would say, the rabbit out of the hat. That what managers might like to have is a solution. Have they heard about this? Do they know about that? Not necessarily a solution to their problems, but assisting them to recognize what's the prob what are the issues ahead. And pr academics and researchers are often in touch with policymakers more than managers um, and can bring that new perspective, can tell them what's coming ahead um, and therefore get their, the value of research. Researchers can also help managers. Managers are probably understudied. If you want to do a research topic, what about managers? They are crucial, aren't they, to the work of frontline practitioners, except that we often um, love to hate them and hate them um, in, in many ways. They are the problem. Um, they take a lot on. The work of a social work manager is probably understudied. Uh, what makes a good manager and how do you define what good looks like? So I think, in a way, it's drawing managers in rather than always having to argue the case. And some of the best studies I've done have been with managers uh, because they've wanted the chance to tell the story of what it's like to be a manager. It sounds lovely, doesn't it? I'm a manager. Everything does, everybody does what I say. Um, not in social work. Um, so, probably not in most professions, but certainly not in social work. How do you manage that? How do you manage that... Um, way in which you went into social work to deal with clients and individuals and you're dealing with paperwork all the time. Um, so difficult jobs to do and I think we need to know more about social work managers because they represent the profession within the employing organisation. I, I thought to just also share from my personal experience, I mean in terms of do I have um, I have like 0.2 FTE for research. So we say, wow, Crystal, you're so lucky you have protected time. And it's on a Friday. I've learned to block out my Fridays. And I try to be territorial about it. I haven't been successful. <laughs> so, so um, I, and, I, and I believe it's important to um, be willing to use some personal time for that. Uh, of course, I hope for the situation to improve, but what I mean to say is it's really the passion that drives us and um, we have to start somewhere. And as, um, I do put uh, research into my practice. While it is difficult, but I can see that when I get the study outcomes, you'll be, um, you'll be full of potential, especially in terms of policy change, funding and all. Yeah. I just want to add on to what Prof G said about um getting the managers involved. I would like to propose, even at a higher level, getting the organisational involved. I mean, all organisations in, in our country, social service sector, you go for a retreat, don't you? Staff retreat, da da da. So when you go for strategic planning exercise, put that in the agenda. Not just managerial level, I think. There are a lot of potentials to bring this um, practice research at a higher level to contribute to the overall mission and vision of your organisation, and that would be fantastic. Good morning. Uh, my name is Clemus Lim from SPD. I'd like to ask a question. I uh, would appreciate if you can advise us with this partnership between practitioners as well as researchers from anywhere. Who has the uh, ownership rights? And uh, can you also help us to understand a little bit uh, what's the processes or what would the partnership looks like? Thank you. Um, do, we, do you want it from the example from UK? Or you want the IP? Yeah, I think um, as far as I know, this issue has to be agreed upon before the research begins. So at this point of time, I think IP rights will um, be uh, lodged with NUS, but people can write jointly. Because the research is actually conducted under a fund that is cited in NUS. So actually, the data is the property of NUS. But that is not to say that, you know, the agencies that work with us have no access to the data. 
But if you are to write, then it will have to be a joint um, uh, effort on both sides. How do they do it? Sorry? Um, I suppose I could just give one example from my personal experience. For example, we had um, a grant by the um, Singapore Children's Cancer Foundation. One of my colleagues and I actually were helping them to do a needs assessment um, survey for um, survivors of childhood cancer, what their needs are beyond you know, the treatment phase. You know? And so what we did was we helped to conceptualize the study uh, we did a questionnaire, we obtained uh, ethics approval from IRB in NUS, and um, CCF actually used their funding to um, employ the research assistant to actually conduct a survey to um, you know, contact their own um, clientele as samples, etc. So when that was all done, uh, we did the analysis for the um, you know, for the uh, study. So uh, CCF will fund the person who key in the data in SPSS, you know, but we will run it and then we will interpret the data, right? And we will share with them. So what happens is that the um, CCF wanted a copy of the uh, original data and we, and we gave it to them because they funded the study, right? But the SPSS file is lodged in NUS because that's the intellectual property part because we did the analysis. Right? But they actually could then conduct further analysis on their own from the raw data, right? from the survey, the, the responses from the survey. So any article that we write now and a presentation that we make at um, social work conferences, etc., would have um, my colleagues, as well as uh, CCF, as joint uh, authors of the article or presenters. Does that make sense to you? I, I mean, that's the only example that I can give in our local context here. I don't know about UK. How do you all do it, Ju? I think it's an important part of the preparation of the fund to, um, to get that clarified. And obviously, all studies will be different. And some people may want to look at their employer's data, um, which cannot be passed over. Um, some people will want to collect new data. Some people want to collect no data. Um, so I think the questions of intellectual property need to be addressed. And also to have discussions with people about what it means um, and what the disadvantages and advantages of going down certain options are. So again, I think that's part of the preparation for the, for the fund. If you do discover the cure for the common cold, um, I'm sure <laughs> that um, the university will be more than delighted to take all the intellectual property um, that it possibly can. Um, but in, so, and in social work, we may not do that, but we certainly may find it appropriate to develop scales of measurement, to develop training programs that have certain uh, names and appear to have validity and credibility. Um, so I think it is an important area to talk about. And this is serious business, isn't it? It's very easy to say we're all researchers, we're all in the same boat, but the serious matters matter, but are best addressed early on so that everybody is clear about the property because um, the practitioner as a researcher will not be a student. And it's that change of status, I think, um, um, that is involved in this fund about a, a equality, but also addressing each other's needs. Did you want to add any more, Crystal? Oh, so, so um, again, coming from a, a medical social work perspective, that we have a joint multi-agency study um, about care experience. Um, and so it involves um, Changi, General Hospital, SGH, Tan Tok Seng, NUS. And I'm the PI, I'm the principal investigator. Am I the most involved? Actually, no, it's actually NUS side. And it's got to do with the legal agreement um, as you, because it's using patient data and although it involves other um, institution, ah, oh, this is recorded. Otherwise, the word underuse is maybe SGH is a bigger institution. They, they, they have a certain expectation, and I have to become the PI. 
the, the word I want to use is Cao Kuan. La. <laughs> Cannot erase from the video, <laughs> but, but 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 you see you 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 um so so it's it's actually a SGH way of protecting pa uh, our patients' uh, data and confidentiality. So it really um is on a case by case basis. But I'm sure as you know as we have more uh, discussions and seminars to be clearer how things go. So it's, it's not going to be a one size fits all. Yeah. Just just to add on, actually uh, we are the PI here. This is research is um, held at the Next Age Institute at NUS, and also the Center for Social Development Asia. Uh, well, so we are actually the, the key PI, the principal PI. But, but you see, this why this thing about collaboration, we need to have a discussion and a conversation. And because we're entering the hospital systems, there are a lot of confidentiality, sensitivity to data. So we need to work that out. But we strike the understanding that, the hospitals being having to have PIs is really structural, technical, it has to be done. We respect that. But the working understanding is that NUS will be the, the facilitator in terms of uh, how to handle the whole entire research process, right? From data collection with all the three hospitals, we coordinate that at our level. We, we um, supervise our research assistants and we make sure that data collection is of good integrity. So from our perspective, it worked well because we hold that here and the ground people are so relieved, right? Because we relieve them of the groundwork, we do it here. But if things are not getting moving right, we will go back to the hospital and say, Crystal, you know, could you please uh, help with the data? It's not coming forth as fast as we can. So that's where we um, collaborate. So at our level, we would have the rights to the, the data of the three hospitals uh, with the data, I mean, the confidentiality issues being addressed. And, but the hospitals will have the, the access to their data base about the patients they want to further crunch their data. And publications will do joint. I think that's our agreement too. Yeah, hope that helps. So I think if you come from uh, um, smaller agencies, you won't, to, you won't have to handle so much of the legal aspects. But from the experience, it's just wonderful. I mean, this is because um, I'm, I'm quite new in coming back. But it has been a wonderful experience collaborating with NUS because really I, I, there are so many issues I'm unable to do on the ground, but they have the support to do it. Yeah. So I need to clarify, I'm the site PI, whereas they are the, 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 the overall the study belongs to them. Sorry, I just want to have a follow-up question on that. So when we earlier mentioned about the twenty to 30,000 uh, research grant, so does that mean that the research grants that we apply would go to, uh, to the universities because you all will be engaging the research assistant? Or uh, because on the agency angle, we are also spending man hours to make sure that uh, research is done properly, gathering the data and whatnot. So do we get also a certain a percentage of the grant so that it can also cover our man hour cost. Thank you. Actually, we haven't received any grant yet, so we <laughs> <laughs> need to have a look at it. But I think what happens is that we will invite um, people to submit proposals. And most of the time, proposals will also cover a budget for manpower needs. Right? I think the academics are already getting their salary, so I don't think you need to factor them into the manpower. But in terms of like, for example, if you um, you have a staff who's going to work, say, uh, 0.5 or something in this particular project for the next three months, and you want to factor that into your budget, that can be considered as you know part of the expenses. Okay. So I think every proposal will look different. And the selection committee will then um, look at the, the uh, how should I say, um, you know, whether in fact the um, budget is uh, valid and whether there are, you know, overestimations or underestimations. Uh, we do that in NUS in any case when we submit proposals for research. Does that, does that help? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Actually, I, I just want to say just one thing before we uh, close this discussion on the, um, raising research, uh, interest in research. I think there was uh, somebody was mentioning this. 
I just want to uh, reiterate, uh, reiterate what uh, Isabel said earlier about the clinics that we are going to uh, hold in the department uh, by Professor Ian Shaw. I think there are a few clinics that are going to be organized to help practitioners think about the ideas, the questions that you have in your head. All right? The clinics will be... Um, mainly conducted by Professor Ian Shaw. He's from the University of York. And he's actually, or he was the one of the founder members of this um, journal called Qualitative Social Work. And I expect many of us uh, in the field will be doing some form of qualitative social work, data mining uh, type of research, if at all, or um, maybe action research projects. You know, um, so uh, please do bear this in the, these clinics in mind and uh, come and sign up for them. Uh, I think you'll be here from August uh, for about uh, 10, 11 months. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll be uh, trying to uh, make use of his expertise as much as possible. So please do sign up for these clinics, um, you know, and they will help you greatly, I think, in terms of uh, thinking about and writing your proposal for um, submission to this grant. Uh, any other? Yes. Hi, my name is Yong Hao. Um, medical social worker from the Cancer Centre, Singapore. Um, my question is actually more fund-related. Um, given that the fund is limited in initial phase, and let's say in its narrow, you receive a lot of proposal, is there a particular focus area that the fund is looking at at the beginning? And what are the priorities? Because you know, you get proposals from the medical side, from the community side, I'm pretty sure there's a certain priority that you will look at, given the limited resources we have. Maybe I can ask the head to uh, speak a little bit more about this. <laughs> Although I do have some knowledge, but you know, over time, you know, we might have refined that. Uh, Yong Hao, thanks for the question. So the priority of funds allocation um, will be decided by the steering committee. So it really depends on what kind of application we receive, and then the selection committee would have to select the shortlist. Uh, the best, most feasible ones, and then forward it to the steering committee. So they will decide how to prioritize the uh, shortlisted list of applications. Yeah. At this point of time, the steering committee has no um, explicit priority list. Yes. Mm. Mm. I think I think uh, in terms of the nature of the fund itself, um, probably you know you'll be quite safe if your proposal is uh, based on something that you can, on a topic that you can do something about after you finish your research. <laughs> All right, it's not going to be just a piece of paper, article, or a report that you're going to put on your shelf. All right. So um, if you could indicate maybe in your proposal that, you know, this research is going to help us to do this, you know, if it's workable, then I think you probably stand a higher chance of uh, being noticed. Does that help? Okay. Uh, yeah, somebody else has a question. You have a question, John? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to... Um, suggest uh, that the Social Workers Association currently has uh, tea sessions and um, if you address this to to SASW and say you have uh, some interest in a particular topic and you want to call for a tea session I think that would be a very good idea because then instead of limit, limiting it to a single agency, you have other social workers who will come on board and chit chat with you and then maybe we will be able to find a lot more interesting uh, practice questions to be uh, further developed for research purposes. So um, this is one point. The second point I want to uh, suggest that we think a little bit more about is this big question that always we have this research and now increasingly more difficult to understand because when you see research studies, there will be this report 
uh, on the methodology, and the methodology is is out of this world. And uh, and unless there is somebody who translates it out into layman's language, it becomes very difficult to be assessed by people who are not so skillful in research. And, and research areas and methodology is improving all the time. And so I think this translation work has to be done if we want the reports to be used more successfully and more widely. And so I think we need to think in this um, particular research fund whether there's some way we can help facilitate this, this um, uh, interpretation so that it's not just mothers who will read, but mothers who will read and query <laughs> the research. Can I just uh, say something? I'm Alicia from the department. So I'm actually just giving a comment and also doing some publicity. Uh, next week, uh, Professor uh, Manfor has agreed to actually hold a one-day uh, workshop on practice research uh, in the department. So do you do not have to wait till August. So if you have a question and you're curious about how you're going to actually uh, use it and research it in your department, we'll urge you to come and attend the workshop. It's actually in your uh, folder in the packet, so just do sign in. Thank you. Yeah, just to add on to Alicia, I think my other colleague, um, um, AP uh, Chu Hei Kyung, will be also conducting another workshop on program evaluation. All right, research has many different types. All right, so program evaluation is just one that it seems to us that the field is very interested in, right? So uh, she's going to run a workshop also under the fund, all right? So please watch out for all these and then come and um, just make use of these, um, you know, uh, resources available from the department. Uh, thank you, John. Any other? Yes. Hi. Hi, my name is Yi Ting. Um, I used to be a practitioner in, as a MSW in hospital. Now I'm currently working as a research executive in the social service research center part of um, NUS. So, so I'm an advocate for practice research as well, but um, I just want to play a bit of the devil's advocate here, uh, asking this question. Just wondering whether there, be, there is any unintended consequences or things that are like potential, yeah, potential unintended cons consequences of promoting practice research. Um, so one thing I was thinking of is that, uh, like for example, like policymakers um, need to hear more, needing to hear more research and evidence from the ground, like uh, instead of, so one thing I'm thinking of is that it shouldn't replace continual feedback from the ground, which I, I believe there is now like, a good feedback loop in terms of networking sessions, but we wouldn't want a case where um, for everything to be translated into uh, more macro practices, we need a research paper backing it up because it might be very costly and time intensive as well. So I'm just wondering whether there's any um, any kinds of things we unintended things that we might might not have considered, and any examples from UK for that, and how how do we um, mitigate that? Yeah, thank you. Oh. Thinking about the unintended consequences of such a fund. I suppose that one consequence might be that people will want to go and do teaching and more research and then not work in practice anymore. <laughs> and that would be a bad idea. <laughs> but people do move on and education, research um, and other areas are enriched by people who have been in practice. Uh, not everybody in social work will want to stay in practice all of their life. Some people do, but some people don't. In England, we do have a big problem in that the average working life of a social worker is about eight years. People get burnt out, um, as, they, as we would call it. They are emotionally exhausted, and their sense of personal accomplishment gets damaged by that. So social workers sometimes do need to move on. Maybe they need to move on, but they also need to come back. And perhaps one of the ways of enti enticing people back to social work is saying, listen to what's going on in practice. Um, you can play a part in this. So I think there are some consequences. It would be bad if nobody, who, if everybody who did 
a practice um, research award, then left practice. That would be a, um, a difficult outcome to manage. But people do move in social work and we need to recognise that. Um, and sometimes that's for the benefit of everybody, themselves, their clients, their colleagues and their managers. Um, so just addressing that is an unintended consequence. The other point about supposing researchers find something that's really difficult to say and very difficult to hear, uh, which is perhaps the big, the big issue, yes, social workers should do that and should find out and should say what we're doing is perhaps the, um, the approach, we're going the wrong way. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are some where social workers have thought very clearly about is this the right way that we're doing things because it's custom and practice um, and perhaps there's another way of doing that. I think perhaps one example I would give is, um, is from a long time ago, but it was the research of, a, of somebody who was associated with social work who in the UK found that parents were not allowed to visit their children who were sick in hospital because it upset the children upset the parents of course didn't it that they couldn't visit them but she found and she argued that make allowing parents to visit the children when they were in a hospital bed in the hospital ward was for the benefit but everybody else knew so they thought that that was a bad idea so i think individuals can make a difference in those very um, and that's one example which nowadays in the UK if you're the parent of a child in hospital you virtually sleep on the floor next to them um, for for a long time and you have parents rooms and you're not a nuisance on the ward anymore so that's a, a good example isn't it of a social work type person standing up and just saying do you know I don't I don't think that's right I can hear the children crying I can hear their mums crying when they leave or when they're not allowed to do you, you used to be able to send a postcard. Anybody remember postcards? Uh, you used to send a postcard to your child when they were in hospital. And um, how very telling that appears to us now um, when we perhaps have to spend a lot of time with children in hospital. But that's because everybody knew that was right until one day everybody thought that maybe it wasn't. Yeah, thank you, Ju. I think the, the other point that was made just now was this question about do we need to do a practice research for everything? I mean, there are some things that we can just go ahead and do and, you know, so we, we don't have to waste time on doing this research. And I thought that's a very good question because that really helps us to think about do we really need to do this piece of research? And which is one of the reasons why I think when we ask people to submit proposals, it has to be endorsed by your agency, that the agency feels that you really need to do this. Because if that issue or problem uh, or practice of practice can be resolved without a piece of research, why not just go ahead with it, right? And I can think of so many examples, you know, of people starting new services because nobody else, including the agency that they had been working with, wanted to pick up this very important piece, but it may be a very small piece for a small percentage of the population that you work with, all right? So there are many um, NGOs, VWOs that have individuals who want to champion this a particular area of work have come out and set up their own. And we'll be very happy to, I think, you know, consider the pro a proposal to actually study the feasibility of doing this. Right? So, um, yeah, they may be this kind of unintended, um, you know, um, um, obsession with uh, practice research, but it shouldn't be, I think, if we think about it properly at the individual and the organizational level. I've just been flashed a card to say there's just one minute left for us before we break for lunch, okay? I mean, we had the five minute one, so I just ignore it. But, uh, <laughs> so can I just have one last question, if there is any, from the floor? No, that one minute is a real, uh, yeah. So I, I just want to um, just thank uh, my panel members here and you in particular. I think it's important for us to go back and think about the four Ps that she's been uh, talking about just now in her slide. If I remember, it's thinking about other people, you know, it's um, not just about ourselves or, you know, what we do, but the people we work with, uh, other people that may not even be in our caseload, but are important. 
Then the uh, second P is the pressing problem. Is it very pressing? Do we need to do it straight away? You know, so many of you in your practice might have noticed uh, issues and people that you think really, really need to be, um, you know, uh, looked at. Um, third one is puzzling. Do you have a question, you know, that's in your head floating around, but you, um, like I think it was Vincent who said, or is it Martin who said that um, you you need to find out more about this, you know. So please do, um, you know, uh, contact us, and then also you know um, the possibility of um, studying small areas. Sometimes it's a very big issue, but you might want to cut it down to a bite size, and so that you can actually make a difference in that specific area of work. So uh, with that, I just want to. Um, Thank Jill and Corinne and Crystal and the floor for being so active. This is one of those rare occasions where we didn't have to wait forever for somebody to go to the mic and say something, you know, at a, at a public forum like this, right? And lastly, I think I just want to thank uh, Keith and Irene and Michelle for being here uh, throughout this whole morning's, um, you know, um, activities. Uh, thank you for your time and your support. And the time is as important to us as the financial support for the fund. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Dr. Ao, Professor Jill, Dr. Lim, and Associate Professor Go. We now invite Associate Professor Esther Go back on stage to present Professor Jill Menthorpe and Dr. Crystal Lim with tokens of appreciation. Associate Professor Go, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope today's event has been enriching for everyone and we hope to have your continued support. If you have any queries about the fund, you may approach our secretariat, Dr. Isabel Sim, uh, afterwards during the lunch. And uh, I would also like to invite all of you to fill up the evaluation form, which is placed in the info packs, to give us feedback before you take your leave for the networking lunch, which is located right outside the auditorium. Your feedback is important as it helps us to improve. You may pass the completed forms to our working committee when you make your way out for lunch later. Thank you for joining us today and help yourselves to a good lunch and networking session. We wish you a pleasant day ahead.